everyone. My name is Hassan Kawakawaii, and I'm the technical manager with Cargill uh, Bioindustrial. And what I want to speak about today is a path toward reliable implementation of rejuvenators, which is a process our industry has been going through uh, over the last few years, um, as it has also been working with balanced mix design and other related initiatives. Before getting into that, just briefly introduce uh, where I'm coming from. Um, I work with Cargill, which is a producer of uh, different bio-based additives in the market, rheology modifiers, rejuvenators, bore mix additives, and other stuff. Um, and these are marketed and sold across the world um, in different markets, North America, Europe, Asia, and uh, South America. And um, these are being approached in this market's approach through a collaborative partnership type um, from initiation and um, initial design work all the way through the end. And through that, we've had the um, pleasure of working with a lot of agencies, a lot of uh, uh, producers, and a lot of different stakeholders um, that have uh, guided us in this process of understanding how to responsibly and uh, practically implement some of these technologies and innovations into asphalt mixes. And that kind of relates to our discussion today, um, where you know, I like to start out with just aging. I know a lot of folks uh, on this call are probably very familiar with it. Asphalts uh, continuously oxidize and age uh, during their service life. That aging occurs from the top down. And as that um, happens, the asphalt binder becomes more brittle uh, and more susceptible to cracking, has a harder time uh, healing the cracks that are and the micro damage that occurs constantly through environmental loading, through traffic loadings. And when we mill up an old road as wrap and put it back into a new pavement, um, it's going to take those properties with it. And at a low content of wrap, we have seen, and as an industry, we know that uh, we can. Um, offset that impact by using soft asphalt with uh, very little issue. Um, Great dumping quite often is what we would refer to this as. Um, and this has been shown to be fine, uh, you know, 15, 20 percent asphalt binder, sometimes higher, lower uh, replacement with wrap uh, with a grade dump works. Uh, it does become somewhat of a challenge as we start to further increase the wrap content as you try and lower more and more of your uh, degrade and soften your asphalt binder, um, not having having something that is necessarily um, penetrating into the wrap and really integrating that into a cohesive continuous binder starts to become an issue. Uh, you can make your mix overly tender by putting really soft binder with that stiff wrap at those high contents in there, and really balancing that becomes an issue. And um, the other thing is it doesn't have much adjustability if you're doing know, a great dump with uh, one wrap and your wrap becomes stiffer, um, you really can't address uh, anything or change anything with an asphalt binder in that case uh, beyond that as much as you can with uh, adjusting dosages with a rejuvenator, for example. So that becomes more critical at higher wrap content, which is why rejuvenator uh, becomes uh, you know, an engineering solution that we like to consider in these cases. So what is rejuvenation? Um, I like to say, you know, it's a term that's quite popular, but a little bit inaccurate when it, if folks think it's undoing the aging or oxidation, it doesn't. What it does undo is that impact that that aging and oxidation has um, on how the different chemical fractions in the asphalt interact together and how they associate and how they cre could create brittleness issues. That is what a rejuvenator is reversing, that type of association. Um, and when it does this, this job properly, what we see is um, restoring cracking resistance without um, sacrificing or compromising running resistance, improving workability and compaction, you know, by actually getting some of that binder on the wrap to work for you again, and increasing your overall effective binder content um, in that mix. Um, and by effective, I don't mean by the mix design. Um, you know, connotation of the term, but in terms of what's actually contributing towards your performance. Um, and improving aging susceptibility. We do know that there's a clear impact with aging and 
uh, when you put rejuvenation and rejuvenators in there, you don't want it to just undo that initial impact on day one and lose that impact very quickly. You need it to have equal and preferably better aging resistance compared to um, a typical lower wrap asphalt binder. And you need it to have predictable, reliable results. And I think this is really important. Everything we do in this industry um, is based on consistency and reliability. Uh, contractors get paid on providing consistent, reliable performance. And this is what, and uh, you need your rejuvenator to be a risk reducer when you're using wrap. And so being able to um, work uh, with your supplier, have the predictable performance, and understand how to use it uh, to improve reliability is certainly going to be an important aspect of that. So how are rejuvenators used? Um, typically, these are at a uh, relatively low dosage, 1 to 3 percent uh, of the asphalt binder um, is, you know, typical. So we're talking about stuff that's in the order of a tenth of a percent of the total mix. And they're often added multiple different ways. The most popular for continuous plants or drum plants is by inline blending them into an asphalt binder line, the virgin binder AC. Um, you know, using pumps very similar or the same as your anti-strip pump or your um, warm mix, liquid warm mix additive uh, pump. Um, other types of plants like batch plants have also used models where you're preteening the wrap or you are um, essentially adding it into the pug mill. And all of these can work if you have good engineering and can uh, control that you have uh, good uh, distribution of your rejuvenator, uh, which is, you know, at the end, that having good uh, engineering controls and um, being able to log and trace what you're doing is certainly a biggest imp uh, one of the biggest factors in determining how to do it best in your specific plant. So getting to the topic of the day, so what's the process of producing these high wrap mixes and really implementing this into your uh, process? Of course, you know, if there's some things that need to be there fundamentally, um, you know, you need to know how, how much wrap your plant can actually handle if you're, do you didn't have any material uh, uh, issues or uh, performance issues. Um, so what's that maximum wrap capacity? The, uh, the belt, the uh, temperature handling, the, you know, everything. Um, and looking at, you know, how you're going to introduce your rejuvenator, we talked about that a little bit. And, you know, importantly, do you have enough wrap? You know, if you're looking to increase your wrap content by 10%, by 15%, what is that going to do to your overall wrap balance? And, you know, where are you going to use that? So, you know, common sense practical questions for sure. You know, often the answer is there is a percentage of wrap that can be added to certainly to a, a subset of mixes. Then you get to which mixes are I may, am I going to implement these in? Usually, the path of implementation for any supplier or producer is starting with uh, commercial mixes. Um, there's millions of tons of these high wrap rejuvenated mixes, commercial mixes that are being put down in uh, North America and the U.S. and have been gone, going down for years now. Uh, so certainly a very proven application, but it's also a good way for a uh, mix producer that hasn't done this before to get their feet wet. Um, and Again, you want to have good quality control processes, work with your supplier to have good uh, understanding of your performance and put the proper metrics, uh, even if it's just for your internal use. Um, and then when we get to the implementation for our agency spec mixes, it's, it's going to be pretty similar. At the end of the day, you still want to make a good, responsible, high quality mix. Um, but you do have a stakeholder now in the agency that needs to also they need transparency, they need to be able to audit the quality, they need to understand that you know, what they're actually buying is meeting their requirements. So having those framework and specification for transparency and reliability is certainly important. And this is something the, specific, the industry has been working on for a number of years now. You know, one aspect of it is just transparency on the rejuvenator itself. How do we spec these? How do we even um, control this? And one of the things that um, has happened there uh, in the recent years is the updating of the ASTM D4552. 
Uh, this has been around for years. It's um, essentially a standard that looks at the um, rejuvenators based on um, safety and handling performance, aging performance, um, just in the additive itself, not an asphalt mix or binder. So it's your initial screening step. Uh, looks at how much they change during an RTFO to make sure it's safe to put these into an asphalt plant. And they categorize them by viscosity. Um, typically, most bio oils would fall under you know, this category RA0 or 1 because they have a lower viscosity. And most petro-based petro oils fall into RA1, RA5, a little bit of higher viscosity. These are the ones that would be used in an asphalt application. And you can see an example there of um, types of properties you can get um, in rejuvenators that you know can meet these specifications quite safely. So looking at this process at the high level of how an agency could implement these um, and, and to, a, to a, a degree how any supplier or any pr producer would implement this, you have a step zero which is checking that the basic um, recycling agent requirements in terms of safety and uh, physical requirements are being uh, satisfied. Then you want to, uh, you know, typically the next step, you know, step zero, usually your supplier of the rejuvenator will have to provide you with that information. That's not something that you would necessarily do yourself as a user. Step two, or step one in this case, would be establishing your dosage and your binder properties. Quite often this is done in collaboration with your rejuvenator supplier to determine that change in delta TC and some of those things could be part of it. Um, once you have that set, then you get to that performance, that balance mix, perform the balance mix design. And this is where, you know, quite often that's the step that's added when you're doing the agency mixes and where agencies are able to essentially make sure they're getting what they needed to get from this mix. Um, and, you know, this is a process right now, ASTM D4552, uh, the 2020 version would address uh, step zero, and we are getting you know, multiple potential specifications coming out of NCHRP 9-58 uh, report that just came out, or the NAPA recycling agent guide that just came out also are great um, resources for this. Uh, and this is you know, a scheme that isn't uh, you know, novel for the, our industry. Our industry has been using very similar types of stepwise schemes with uh, um, hot and place recycling and scrub seal uh, applications on the paper preservation side with rejuvenators um, with the same stakeholders. And it, it is certainly a process that has worked. And so I think that it, there's, uh, it definitely is something that can be used in our hot mix side here too. Uh, example of how this has been uh, deployed in a, you know, very, in a Virginia setting is the test track that was done at NCAT in 2018. So this was uh, produced on the existing, uh, the old VDOT sections that Virginia had uh, done some previous test tracks on. Those same base layers were taken and the top layers were milled off. And in coordination with VDOT, um, a uh, mixed producer uh, in Virginia uh, was selected and mixed designs were selected. and their material was trucked out of Virginia to the NCAT test track to put down these using the specification that VDOT has been um, proposing for and um, using uh, for balanced mix design using ideal CT, Contabro, and APA. Um, these went down in 2018. They've just about finished the 10 million ESOL loading cycle that they've had over the last three year cycle. And, um, working very well, and I'll get onto the data. Um, the uh, control mix in this case was a 6422 binder with a uh, Anova Warmix additive and 30% wrap. And this was uh, compared to a high wrap mix. Again, it's the same 6422 with a rejuvenator, uh, Nova 1815, and 45% wrap. So that was the increase that was done there. And balanced mix design approach was used here. So we initially had the you know, volumetric design for the 30% wrap that was been used in Virginia. Um, it became clear that that wouldn't meet uh, the balanced mix design requirement and spec that uh, Virginia is setting. So that was updated, resulted in a 0.3% higher binder content, 
the same balanced mix diet approach was taken to uh, optimize and create the high wrap mix. And these met all of the requirements that uh, are in the V.BMD. You kind of, uh, to look at them in a um, kind of in a, in a um, graph wise, you can see how we went from that um, lower quadrant there with where the running had no issues, but the CT index was lower than required, moving kind of straight up into a, the allowable CT index range without any real issue or impact on the rutting, which is exactly the ideal situation we want. So that's on the design side. In the field, uh, in the lamp, in the, looking at the performance, we saw you know, things really uh, shake out the way we want to. So of course, you know, in the previous graph, you saw where the APAs and the uh, ideals shook out, but looking at the specifications that are being used in other states, um, looking at Hamburg wheel tracking, looking at iFit flexibility index, and to the disc compact tension um, testing at low temperature for uh, thermal cracking, and looking at overlay tester that's being used in a number of northeast states uh, and, and in you know, Texas and a few other places, you can see that in all of these cases, these balanced mix design approach uh, with the different tests all showed the same thing that you could make this high wrap rejuvenated mix to be at least equal, but in, you can see actually arguably better in, in some cases performance in terms of durability at cracking compared to your control mix. So the lab performance, regardless of the type of testing scheme we used here, came back pretty consistent, um, which is good news because there's a lot of different design methods we're using across the country here. Um, and at the end of the day, though, the, you know, the proof's in the pudding. It's got to perform on the road, and it did. You know, after, uh, you know, that about we're getting to that 10 million easels now, which is more than most pavements uh, ever see uh, in real life in terms of axle loading, there's zero cracking. Uh, so that's, you know, excellent for what we're looking for. There's no rutting. And, you know, in these graphs, the gray dots are the control, and the colored dots are the high wrap section. So you can see that the permanent deformation measurements throughout that, that process are you know, um, exactly on top of each other in that you know, two, two and a half millimeter range, so no rutting issues. And the ride has been uh, very smooth. Actually, the, um, you can actually see that the IRI is even lower for and smoother for the high wrap section. So no concerns absolutely there after 10 million loading. And because of the success here, we actually decided that we will continue this uh, into a second loading cycle. So another 10 million loadings for three years um, and um, 20 million ESOL. So um, we should expect more data to come over the years as we push this beyond uh, what most pavements see and kind of really take this to the extreme. So summarizing the conclusions of what we talked about today, um, you know, rejuvenation has been, has, and technology has been used for years now in millions of tons. Um, North America is being used every year, uh, millions of commercial uh, tons being put down and more agencies doing it now too. The NTAD test track is certainly a, uh, a model of how this can be done and how using the Virginia DOT uh, specs that was successful and also comparing with other specs that states are using, other states are using, how that those balance mix design schemes can really work to do this. And you know, the pavement performance also confirms that you're making a quality mix here. Um, so there is a, a process that can be do, done. There is a framework that has worked for other aspects of our industry that can be followed, that's practical, that uh, we've carried out with multiple uh, states and agencies and, 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 and countries and geographies that can be done to get these done without anyone taking any uh, outsized risks or um, uh, any degree of uncertainty. And finally, doing all of this right, taking advantage of the ASTM specifications and the NCHRP work that's happening, um, there is a framework that, to make these spec mixes transparent and reliable for all stakeholders. Now I'll leave you with just a few uh, examples that, and as references. Of course, there's uh, material will continue to come out on these test tracks. Uh, the NCAT test track I showed is actually part of a set with another min road sister section that have equally been performing very well with no issues. Um, 
There's the MCHRP 9-58 report I spoke of, and then the NAPA, the excellent um, user's guide that has been, was released last year is a great, uh, in 2020, as a great resource for folks to look at that are looking to implement these. Uh, with that, I thank you all for your attention, and uh, certainly would be happy to answer any questions uh, today, or please feel free to reach out to me to discuss this further at a later time. Thank you very much, and have a great day.